And at this juncture, as we prepare ourselves, I'm going to be inviting the panelists to join us. Professor Rafael Balma, come on up on stage. We're also inviting Rear Admiral Jacques Rivera, the head QSSE, Asia Pacific CMA, CGM. Mr. Jamie Ramsamy, the head of HSSEQ, Thom Group. Captain Ritesh Chawla, Senior Manager for Marine Safety and Vetting, Rio Tinto. We're also very pleased to invite our moderator for this segment. He is Captain Vibas Graj, the Director for Safety and Training at Wallam Group. Welcome. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, all of you being here. Thank you for the lovely uh, presentations, Peter and Rafael. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody out here, as well as globally who are watching us. It is an honor to share the stage with such esteemed panelists. Uh, some of whom have traveled a wee bit to come here. And uh, I couldn't have hoped for better experts on this subject, really. So thank you to MPA for organizing this. Uh, when we were actually thinking of this topic uh, in uh, the National Maritime Council, uh, we were pondering whether we have done enough from the point of view of technology that the Senior Minister of State spoke so much about yesterday in the opening for safety. Um, we have all been in the ISM world for 30 plus years and uh, uh, we have all tried to run safe ships, of course. Um, but in my opinion, I think we are still at the calculative stage of safety. If you look at the Hudson's ladder of safety culture, uh, we do think that we are proactive, but are we really proactive? And we have spent quite a bit of training dollar. We have spent a lot of uh, resources in trying to make our industries safe. Have we really achieved it? And then, of course, uh, we, we thought in the area of uh, technology and data, the vast amount of data that is available, and all of a sudden, uh, after the pandemic and uh, the technology advances, it seems that we can probably start using it to our advantage. And that's where then the thought came, whether we can actually attain that proactive stage using data for safety. Um, many of our... Um, uh, operators, many of the industry actually are, I'm not saying it's, when I say calculative, not everybody is in that stage. Uh, we vary from, from reactive to proactive at times, varies from operator to operator, from culture to culture. But I'll come around with the panelists later on to get your views on that. Uh, historically, we have analyzed a lot of lag indicators as Peter said in your uh, presentation, uh, but are we actually converting them to give us the benefit, of, benefit uh, as, as proactive lead indicators? And these days, uh, safety professionals have so much more data than ever before that it is really hard to see the wood from the trees. Huh? But what we will discuss today is whether it is time to start looking at how this data can be made to work for us. In this plenary, we will discuss about what Peter and Rafael have said and what uh, Jax, Jamie and Ritesh are doing in their organizations, how we are actually trying to use data to be more proactive. And um, let's see how we can make it interesting. I'm hoping for a lot of questions from you, even from some planted few of you. So, uh, but first let me start the discussion with a question that we sent out to this, uh, to all the registrants for this, uh, for this plenary. And it was a very simple yes, no uh, poll. And it is, of course, um, do you believe that data can be used in positively, to positively drive an improvement in safety? Yes, as you can see, 97%. No, 3%. Uh, I think those who say no probably have not understood the question. Um, can it be used to drive data safety? I, I think certainly yes. But what was then asked, which is not there on the slide, 
was a little bit of an open question. If yes, what are you doing? What data are you using to get a proactive safety culture? And if no, why not? So what I saw from the various uh, uh, options that were listed in yes actually surprised me a bit because um, most of the, the uh, audience answered in uh, accidents, incidents, near misses, audits and inspection findings, behavioral based safety uh, data, claims data, AIS, VDR, EGDIS, fine. So we get this data. I have been managing this data for 40 years. Can I claim to be in the proactive stage? I don't think so. Uh, we are still having KPIs in our systems for near misses. Eight near misses per month, four, five, six near misses, whatever it is. We know the quality of our incident investigations is probably not where it should be. Root cause analysis. With all this, it's quite evident that those who have actually answered yes in this are collecting data. But are they using this data proactively? And that's where we start the discussion. So let me start with Ritesh. Uh, in Rio Tinto, I'm sure you're doing a lot with this. What do you have to say about how can you use this data for proactive safety culture? Right. Thanks, Vibhas. Uh, look, before I start with that, I'll give a very quick introduction on what Rio Tinto is and so that the audience has uh, a chance to put our comments into perspective. So in Rio Tinto Marina Logistics, we are a critical supply chain partner to our mining business in Rio Tinto and our customers. Uh, we have a vested interest in shipping because we own 17 vessels and we have a fleet over 230 vessels on charter at any given time. Our key focus with our shipping portfolio is to ensure industry leading safety, environment and operation standards, and not just on our own ships, as well as ships which are on our own charter. Now, talking about the subject, I think the quick and short answer is an absolute yes, but I'll spend a few more minutes just to elaborate what we mean by that. I believe in today's digital age, data has come to play a pivotal role in how we do business and how we manage the risk associated with that, not just for ourselves, our employees, but as well as for our customers, partners, and anyone associated with our supply chain. Now, in our shipping portfolio, we have been using data for quite some time now, but that has essentially been around figuring out the causes and contributed factors after an incident has already happened or a lapse has occurred. Now, this lag indicator, as we call it, is exceptionally well in identifying controls which allow us to put measures in place so that the incident does not occur again. But it is certainly not without its limitations. And the key one which stands out for us more often than not is that the one contributory factor which ends up being used the most following an incident is human error. Which, of course, uh, is something we have evolved to not agree with because the way we look at it now is that human error is not a cause, but it's actually a symptom of an error which occurred somewhere else. And that's the kind of thinking which is pushing us in a direction where we want to see um, evolution of systems which go beyond just looking at human error for safety risks. So it is exactly for this reason we started some work in that space uh, a couple of years ago. And a big thank you to Maritime Port Authority of Singapore and for their Maritime Cluster Fund under innovation, where they are supporting us with this uh, uh, digital tool we have under development. We have come to call this digital tool as SAIL, um, which is an acronym for uh, uh, safety assessment with intelligent learning. And what, what we are looking with that digital tool is that instead of just focusing on the lagging indicators, right, we need to evolve our thinking beyond that and look at are there any risk influencing factors? Like these are the states or conditions which attribute um, or create safety with the system or process. And use that to identify latent failures, which is the chance of something going wrong. 
so that we are in a position, along with our shipping partners and our owners, to put controls in place before that failure actually happens. Now, the big challenge when we were working on this, uh, we realized was that in, term, in shipping, it's really very hard to find risk and feeling factors which are measurable, directly measurable. And thus, the need to start thinking about and evolving into a stage where we are able to identify variables and indicators, which then can give us an indication of something is going wrong and which we would call as uh, uh, leading indicators. So it's still under evolution. We are, we are discussing with our partner owners. We are learning from them how they're going about it. Um, we, we certainly see a number of owners who have evolved to a large extent in that space. They're using data very well, uh, not just utilizing it, but as well as capturing it and you know, uh, putting it into perspective and then creating feedback and controls, where there's large number of owners who are on this journey and looking at that. So we collecting all of that information, other feedback, and trying to put them into perspective in this tool uh, sale, which we are developing. Thank you, Ritesh. We'll come back to the human error side, which you said is a symptom and not a cause. Uh, but Jamie, uh, you are in a similar position as I am in a ship management business, and we know the data we collect. Uh, do you really think that uh, this answer justifies the, the very what we are trying to explore here, that this data which we are collecting is being used proactively for a safety culture? I think um, how I would view it is that most of the maritime industry to date has been collecting, for the most part, the, all of the types of data that you have pointed out. And what we do with it, with it is we process it manually and we try and reflect on what's happened. Okay. What COVID has shown us for the most part now is that you are able to actually increase that volume of data, not just the historic evidence of what has taken place, either from an incident or an accident or like a near miss, but which starts leaning into more into the internet of things that say, you know, Peter's talking about, okay? And what we've started doing and what we've started looking at and started to try to think differently at home is where we are now trying to look at data as a means to try and predict what's going to happen next. Because let's be honest with, with ourselves, the volume of data is impossible for any single man or woman to process in real time to be able to take risk-based decisions properly. And I think everybody who's indicated yes sort of feels that. There's that embedded willingness to realize and embrace the fact that everything that we collect needs time to process and it needs people or machines or software to help us analyze it and support our decisions in a far better way. And we've been collaborating with one of the local universities here to be able to try and take all these, all these data points, both the historic lagging, um, all of the environmental factors, which you know, Peter has been describing, in addition to some of the social factors such as like the, crew, uh, like the crewing demographics in addition to other things and to try and actually see are there correlations between what has happened previously and what we are seeing now in the future happening or as it's unfolding. Can it support us in our decision making to actually ensure that we are able to take a vessel from point A to point B safely for both the asset and the crew? Are we able to become more efficient at doing it as well? And we're seeing that Yes, there is. There is a tangible you know, benefit. Though it should be highlighted that correlation does not equal causation. So you should take that with like a pinch of salt as well. It's really important that the people involved in this, in this collection of data and the analysis of data and the processing of data are the people on the front end who actually understand what the real life situation is. Engagement with the superintendents, with the crew, the frontline people at at the sharp end of the spear, who are taking these decisions themselves, are involved in this. And it's very important to stress upon what Peter and both Tina Raphael said, it's that whilst everybody says 97%, well, 97 of people say yes, it's very important that whatever we do, there's a certain quality and repeatability towards all of it. Thanks, thanks, Jamie. Jax, you are a little bit up the food chain compared to me and Jamie, uh, as um, uh, you know, with so many ships, uh, CMA, CGM, sure you're collecting a hell of a lot of data. Uh, what do you have to say about how you're using this data in your company? Well, 
<clears throat> just to I don't describe you in two words what is CMA CGM, and that you're going to understand probably better what I'm wanted to say. So CMA CGM is a global um, supply chain company. We operate 600 vessels, roughly a little bit less, and we own about 300. So yes, it's it's key. I mean, it's really key. And you asked earlier about how is the shipping industry? Is it good? Is it could be better? Yes, it. It's pretty okay, but I really think, because we all have the same data, that the number of accidents, the number of things is too high. And like you said just earlier, how, how can we, we, I cannot accept having casualties. I come from another world where casualty is not possible, unless it's wartime. It's not wartime, so casualties cannot be, so we have to do something about it. So the first way we use data is that we have done that assessment. And then, then we, we, we use the data roughly in three manners. The first thing is to understand exactly where we stand. And I agree with um, what said Raphael, the quality of data is key here because uh, simple facts that somebody is on the 1st of September and somebody are September 1st. Mm. Stupid idea, but it happens very often. So the quality of data to understand where, where you stand. But it's not enough. Then you have to go more accurate to know exactly where is the problem. And so the first thing we have, we have done, we have launched a safety campaign in CMACGM. And the first item of that campaign is to deep, go deep into where are the problems and who is not sufficiently trained, where is the problem, etc. So the first thing we have done is se seven steps. I'm not going to describe the sevens, but just to give you, the first step is exactly to know where we stand. So we are regularly assessing, asking the top four people what are their safety level, etc. So to, that's the first thing, where do we stand? The second step is, of course, to analyze problems. Why do we have? And here, analyzing, I'd like to say that it's not an easy task because when you have a problem, people falling in the shower, for example, or containers falling, when you, when you look at that, you see that the problem is there, but you cannot just use the ready, standby procedure to analyze it. You, you don't know why it's happening. And sometimes it can be because of lots of you, you have to have access to a lot of data that you don't even know before if it's useful or not for yeah. that particular problem. So you need to have the data and then you need to analyze it, to analyze it, to analyze it, to go. And for, pe for example, for people falling in the shower, is it because of the time of the day, moment of the day, the, 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 the sea state, a combination of two? Not that easy, so it takes time. The third thing we have seen is that, of course, we have, to, we have to improve the system, we have to improve the material, probably changing some things, adding new materials for firefighting, probably having additional tools to be able to extinguish. But also, we need to change the culture. So changing the culture, we have done roughly three things. And I'm going to explain you where data comes into it. The first thing is, of course, changing the culture is not for just for the sailors. It, from the top management, from the bottom, completely to the last sailor. So the first thing we have done, we have launched a program where it's a safety training and involves not only sailors, uh, but people ashore, including from the top, top, high top management about that safety culture. It's a two days program, but it's really, I think it really opens the eyes of everybody. And, uh, I, I consider that that's very important because I think it will change the mindset, it will change everybody's things. Probably when a line manager will, will, will think about pushing a master to do, to take risk, he will think about two seconds, oh, maybe it's not a good idea because he has probably got a little bit of culture. So the data, how do we use the data in that particular case? Of course, we look at this, does everybody have followed the, the, the training? That's very simple. The second thing is we train the sailors. So example, so we are training on two aspects. The first is firefighting, 
we have launched a program where we have extra firefighting uh, training period. And I have to say that, I have to say that it's, it's, we have one data that shows it's pretty efficient because one master who had done the training a few weeks before has been in a situation a few weeks after where he had a, actually a real fire on board and he said, thanks to that, to that training, I've been much, much more efficient. So again, when you look at the data, has everybody in train, how long, etc. You mentioned another fact about bl not blaming, etc. So we launched another program about um, BRM, Bridge Resource Management. And there we're trying to focus on the way the people speak together. Again, the data here is, uh, is to, to improve the, 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 the we, sh we look at all of that. Let's, sorry, let's go back two seconds to the firefighting. The firefighting, there's an additional output which is very useful, is that we have all of these reports. With all of the extra reports, we can see trends. We can see, okay, all of these trainers, or all of these sailors, now they realize this, we don't have this, well, we, this is missing, etc. So we take all of that, because when it, of course, when it's one guy saying, I, I sh I'd like to have this, not enough. But when you have all of that, and we analyze it, and then we say, okay, I think that this is an, uh, really something missing, and we have to go, and we have to acquire additional uh, uh, competence, additional system, additional th thing, and that's another way that we, we use data. And the last thing, the way we use data, of course, there is a feedback, get to, to share that if the, the trend is going in the right direction. And the, the last thing is, of course, we, we we try to, to give as much information to everybody. So the accident, you mentioned the accident. We, we have decided to open much more the analysis of accident. Of course, we, we remove the names, etc. Again, no blame policy. And here, I'm, so first we do that. And second, we look if it's used, because it's nice to put people on, 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 on site, but if nobody reads it, there's a problem. So to be sure that the people are reading it, and if they don't, is it a bandwidth problem, or is it just that they don't care? Or is it just that they don't understand? Or is it just that they don't have time? So, and then, then we dig into it, and we try to, 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 to go further. And I think, from, in my opinion, it's going to take years before we, we, we can improve. Of course, because consistency is very important. But this is the way we, we, we use data. And it's a, I think we are at the beginning of a long journey. But uh, I hope that uh, in a few years, we'll have a, the global, you know, the first indicator, LTI or something like that, dropping at least across. Hope so, Jack. Thank you. Peter, the problem that I think we have, at least in my opinion in the industry, is that we are not trained to sift through data. Uh, we were talking about qualitative and quantitative data, uh, Rafael, and we have a lot lots of qualitative, qualitative data, which may not be of good quality, which maybe we can sift through that, but we cannot convert it to the quantitative data. We, we cannot actually decide which, what is the data and how to use it to generate those leading indicators, right? How do we get over this problem in the industry? Uh, you're correct. Um, we're all in this digital transformation. And it's easy to jump on the bandwagon of just gathering data. That's the easy bit. You can collect the data. <laughs> it's what you do with the data that's important. Mm. And, and how, how you how you get that um, return on the data. Whether that's a return on investment for operational efficiency or whether it's for improving safety. You have to have a reason for wanting to have that data. There's no point in just collecting data. And it's, so it sets off with that, what am I going to do? That's the thing you collectively, as, as a company or an industry or whatever, you have to have that statement that says, this is what we're going to do, because then that focuses the minds in the direction of what data I'm going to get. Because at the moment, it's very easy just to, to gather loads of data. Um, once you've got a 
a good data set, then the an analysis of that data set is far easier. Especially if you are focused on the, what you're trying to execute against. Which is why I kind of put that, you know, wildly important goal. This is why we're doing it. So I'm going to go and measure that. Once you're doing that, then you can really move forward. And, and I just come back on to Jack's, because this is one of the things that I talk about. Um, communication. We've heard about communication. It's important. Um, I am not communicating at the moment. I am broadcasting. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> That's the reality. If I say to this audience, this bottle is full of water, I have no idea whether they know they've taken that in. That's not communication, that's broadcast. Sending a message out or putting a report out or anything like that is broadcast. If I asked everybody in the room to say, do you understand this bottle has got water in it and it's full and, it, and I want you to put your hand up, and people that have put the hand up, I've kind of communicated with. And that's an important aspect of what we do as well. Because once you've analyzed all the data, we are talking about people. And you need to get that through to them. So I would say we need a little bit more um, diligence and focus around what we're taking that data for to begin with. Thanks, Peter. Let's go into the little bit of the fuzzy side of things away from data for Rafael and touching on the human element issue. There was a nice statement on your slide, Rafael, this, that is people as a solution takes me back to uh, what Professor Decker from the Griffith University keeps saying that as long as you see people as a problem, you will not have any solutions to good safety culture. You have to see people as a solution. And in your safe mode report, you have said that uh, uh, just culture was a destination for the shipping industry. But it seems like they gave up, right? Now, we know it's law in aviation, mm -hmm. and we keep comparing ourselves to the aviation industry, which is good to learn something. But why can't we go the just culture way? And isn't that the reason that we are still struggling to have good reporting? <laughs> It's a very tricky question. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I, I will come back a little bit to the journey to safe culture in aviation. I think it's important to, 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 to understand where it's coming from. Basically, in aviation, when there have been a lot of development, first in technology and after in human factors, they were still missing parts. Uh, and it's where they started to come to the idea of just culture. With the idea is you don't blame, you don't fire people like for a small mistake. And all the idea was, what is most important? Is it firing a person and not learning anything, or it is systematic learning? Because if you start to fire anybody after any small mistake or whatever mistake, basically everybody will be afraid. And this is probably where we are in shipping. There is a tendency of not speaking up. And the idea very much for the aviation was to say, okay, how can we open the people to say things and, and the way was to establish this idea of just culture. You can say, you can report whatever mistake you've done at work, we are going to analyze it. It doesn't say that for certain mistakes you are not going to be accountable for. It doesn't mean that. And we have to, to make sure just culture is not completely uh, so simple. It's a little bit more complicated than it looks like. But the idea very much is what is important as an organization, as a system, aviation, we want to learn. We always want to learn because we want to make sure that all, uh, the say ships, all, all planes are always safer and safer and safer. So because I decided to shift the problem from blaming people or the problem are the people, they said, no, what is really important in all this discussion is to collect information, is to learn. And this is just a learning process. And, uh, and when we started to work with the, um, we, we, with shipping, but with this idea for aviation, because as you mentioned, in aviation in European Union, it's, it's law, and basically you, you cannot avoid the idea of just culture. When we started to, to discuss with the first person in, in, in maritime, we just realized quite fast that it was difficult to understand the concept. There is so much the habit of blaming, but there is not only this, there is also the, the problem related to 
investigation leading to looking for responsibility, the role of the crew member in, in case of accidents and how it will be incorporated in a legal dispute and all these elements that made most of the person very uncomfortable with the wording and the pure approach of the, uh, of, of the aviation industry. And, and because we were still thinking that the, the basic principle, which is learning, is very valid, we, we also modified a little bit the idea, said, look, um, we understand just culture may be perceived as in aviation, and something that you modify the responsibility regime of the system and probably putting the, the responsibility of a casualty differently as it is today and probably completely modifying how the ship owner's liability can be engaged or not. So it's, it's very deep, in fact, mm. and, and, and this is more, more about the problems related to the legal aspects that started to fear quite a lot of, of partners that we had in the maritime. And, and, and we decided to, to see how we can still going in the same direction, but with a wording that will be probably uh, less stressful for mm. most of the maritime people. And also coming with a stance, look, we are not going to impose anything which is matching the aviation and not matching the shipping industry. Again, this, this is why this, this project has been very rich, I would say, because it has been a real cooperation. Uh, I mentioned to you at the beginning, the aviation partners, and we are the best in the world, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But, and, and we moderated this very much. We said, look, we have to understand that safety of any, any sector is an historical construction. It's not something which is coming like this. There is no receipt. It's completely integrated into the social dynamics of the sector itself. And if we don't understand this basic principle, we cannot achieve anything. And, and the idea that we can take receipts from here and put them there, uh, it's, it's not really clever because it doesn't work very well. I, I like very much the beginning of what you were saying. You said, we are here for decades in the ISM era and nothing looks very much improving. And, and I think it's, it's, it, it really shows what I was explaining. Because the ISM code, basically, development is uh, Inspiration is basically what happened in oil and gas, but also what happened in the, in the quality insurance with the ISO system. And all this has been imported with the maritime sector without considering the legal regime, without considering the different and the complexity of interaction between ship and shore, without considering that a tool like this one can be used against safety and not for safety because you multiply your bureaucracy. Um, and I think all these elements have not been captured properly. And when the translation has been taken from oil and gas, it became something very difficult to manage. It's not unusual at all in any shipping company, especially big ones, and I work in my time in very big ones, to see that uh, the ISM code represents between 5,000 to 10,000 documents. Uh, I've changed once from a company to another one, and, and, and the end over was two days as the shipmaster. And, and you are supposed to know the ISM code of the company in two days. How can I read 10,000 documents? Just, is it humanly possible? Mm. So after we can talk about violation of procedures, but do I know that the procedures exist? So what are the very purpose of these procedures? And today, when you look at the, uh, the ISM code is becoming like a Google system, that you have a huge number, volume, which is... It's a search engine that you have inside. <laughs> and, and if you look to sometimes some very interesting, and I've done that a long time ago on, on one word, which was bunkering, bunkering procedures. And suddenly I had five, six different bunkering procedures, right? Same contrary to the other one. And I can understand also from the uh, safety department that it's super complicated to manage. It's super complicated to manage because you have this multiplication of elements. But sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm moving from, uh, from the topic. Thanks, but that brings me to, and I'll, I'll take some questions from the audience, and uh, it brings me to an interesting point, uh, which is uh, standardization, right? So when it comes to behaviors, recently we have started moving towards standardizing the competency frameworks. Industry bodies have uh, launched these uh, frameworks and we are trying to implement them. Can we do something like this for data? I will read the question. How does the industry aim to standardize data across so many incidents and so many companies? 
has any shipping company or service providers solved? Let me see if it's coming up on the screen. Uh, I can't read the full question. Regina, you have to do something at the back. Yeah, there it is. I solved the issue. I'll repeat, how does the industry aim to standardize data across so many incidents and so many companies? Has any shipping company or service provider solved the issue? Um, who is the professor amongst us? Oh, professor Bombler. Only one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a Peter, I, maybe I can, I can, I can, I can, I can take, take that. Uh, look, um, and it's certainly a very pertinent, interesting question, and, and I, I must admit, one of the biggest challenges we face as charters, and which is a lack of a singular taxonomy for data ac access in the shipping industry, and especially, um, if you don't mind me saying that, across the bulk sector, we, 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 we have our biggest exposure. And why it is very interesting, and just reflecting back on uh, Jack's and Peter's comments earlier, that this data does exist. And one example that comes to mind is incident investigation. Now, more often than not, any of you here who have done incident investigation, right? So at the end of it, and if you put some more time into it, you can start seeing early warnings, which if detected earlier or picked up earlier, would have prevented that incident. Now, these early warnings could be seen as leading indicators in hindsight. So that information does exist. It's just a matter of creating a methodology wherein that data is able to be captured, maybe like a digital tool. And that's where our motivation is work on the work we are doing on sale, is to create a predictive model, which is able to use leading indicators and predictive data to create outcomes and help us look beyond human error as the risk, as the safety risk. But look, it's, it's a big challenge. It's not, it's not singular. There's no single solution. Like uh, we at Rio Tinto are trying to do our part to create something, but we can't do it in isolation. So we work very closely with our owners. And uh, we, we reach out to the industry, and in fact, uh, we embarked on a number of programs within our organizations that designated owners, where we invite owners to come with us because they are the experts in running ships. We just own 17 ships. We don't run ships ourselves. So we need the input from ship managers, owners, to come and help us define that system. And we are taking them with us on this journey. And then, again, just, just to reflect, like, you know, it's, there are other issues when you start talking about creating a single classification of standard. And the one that really stands out for me is uh, subjectivity. So it's like we are all made up of our own personal experiences and preferences, which is good to have. But it is good until a certain extent. But if you allow it to go out of hand, like I'm talking about you have all this data, it crunches and it gives an outcome but you still need a person at the end of that outcome to read into that data and decide if the ship or a manager or an owner or the set of crew are they sitting at a high risk level, the chances of something going wrong. Now, how do you address that subjectivity? And that's something which we have been discussing uh, for a while now. Um, obviously, one way to addressing the subjectivity is to have a uniform checklist or a uniform set of questions, which obviously given how wide apart the industry is. And if you just reflect upon the ship owners themselves, like each ship owner manager's way of looking at data, assimilating it in terms of safety and acting upon it, is a reflection of how their safety management system evolved over the years. And that is for one reason, we rarely do see two systems to be similar to each other. So you have to respect that. So that is certainly going to be a challenge to have a uniform checklist or uniform set of questions. The other revenue could be to have a classification scheme which allows you to read the information coming out from a number of checklists and inspections, vessel inspection reports, pilot reports, PSC reports, owner's inspections, uh, charter's inspections. Our seafarers go through a number of inspections, so all that are coming out. But the challenge with all the inspection reports is that they are usually written reports with non-conformities or observations at the end of it. They don't necessarily give you indicators. They don't necessarily give you information which can be contributed or used as leading indicators. Hmm. But then if you have a classification scheme where you're able to catalog and categorize, categorize all that information coming and put it into a system, then yes, you're leading somewhere. Then you're looking at creating a classification and getting some outcome out of that. And one more point. And the other thing that we, and it's very interesting again, why we face challenges is that when you're designing this questionnaire or you know, information, one of the interesting points that came out from the team was that we would prefer not to have a binary response. And that was very interesting. 
go beyond a yes and no. And look, having a yes and no is definitely helpful. It's faster, it's easier, and gets your response. But then it suffers from acquiescence bias. That is the tendency to agree, and which could certainly be a challenge for complex situations. So we are designing our safety modules and everything to have wherever required, three to five responses, so that whoever is looking at that is able to give subjective information on that and just agreeing to be, you know, to be so a the yes. polling question was wrong. Sorry? The polling question was wrong then. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, look, again, I'm saying not, not all questions. And see, the, the I core, see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah, the core idea is to make it easier for our seafarers, not create something new, just utilize what is already being used and take it to our advantage and their advantage and to be able to predict things before they go wrong. Okay, let's get to the second question from the audience. Uh, this is for you, Professor Fair. Can you give us an example of a working forward feedback data model? I mean, there is, there is one that uh, I would say everybody is, uh, is doing on normally. I would say it's ju just, for example, when you're at sea, when you're a shipmaster or an officer, you are going to collect weather forecast information. And according to that, you will prepare yourself for, for what's going to be next. But there is also some other source of it forward that we can have. And, and here we can engage more research aspects. And for example, we go on board the ship and we, we talk about rest hours, for example, say, what is the reality of your workload? What, what is the reality of what's happening? And here suddenly you will probably have voices which are going to say something extremely different than what the record says. And, and from that, you can say, aha, uh -huh. here, even if I don't have incidents, even if my records looks nice outside, I have a fatigue problem and I can identify it. And here, because I can identify it through a proper qualitative research, I can here start to move forward and be proactive in order not to wait that the fatigue seafarer is going to have an accident for himself or going to damage the ship. But you can move forward. So that, that's very much uh, the idea. Thank you. Uh, Peter, the next one is coming up for you. And uh, as soon as I get this thing going. Uh, how can we, as an industry influence, work better with the IMO to set ambitious, committed targets to drive safety? Question, can we have it up on the screen, please? I'll, I'll read the question again. It's probably um, going to IMO. How can we as an industry influence work better with IMO to set ambitious committed targets to drive safety? I mean, you had that slide, which is, of course, fictitious. But um, do you think we need to take it up to IMO and set some targets there? Uh, I mean, I was being a little bit you know, controversial in that respect. I'm, I'm not. Um, signaling, uh, kind of putting the IMO on the spot here. I, I think that, um, you know, if we're truly going to take safety to a limit, then it needs to, it needs to come at a, at a high level across an industry, like we, do, like we have done with greenhouse gases. We've recognised that. Um, but, but to me, the, the, the main, main thing from my perspective is that, you know, influencing the IMO, we're all influencing the IMO. I guess it's <laughs> just hearing, hearing what's going on. Uh, and you have your, your member state to put it through and you have your industry bodies and they can all put their opinion in there. Um, it, it's, you know, decarbonisation is going to be at the top. And unfortunately, that, that's the way they all, but safety isn't going to go away. And, and going back to the, the question here, you know, um, probably the last question, that we, we haven't got all the data. There's more, there's more out there to be quite honest. 40% of the reports aren't actually being filed. We, we're not seeing the full picture. Um, and so it is a big issue and it is complex, it's volatile and it's uncertain and all those sort of things, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it. That's, you know, we can't just say, well, okay, it's, it's just, it's tough, you know, we'll just, we'll accept the status quo and move on. Um, we have to, we have to keep the individual things going and we have to, conferences like this do, do bring it to the fore and we need to keep pushing safety uh, for sure. And at some point, I believe, there will be this kind of um, data will come together in the right format and we'll be looking at some of those top key indicators around fatalities at sea, casualties at sea, um, and we will have a, have a better way of moving forward. But it, it will take time 
and, um, and data is going to help us do that. Um, but let's stick and be focused about what we, what we actually want to achieve here. Okay, we are running out of time. I've got a last question with the maximum votes here. For some reason, I don't see the questions coming up, uh, but I'll read it out. What do you mean by improving safety? What type of events do you think need improving? Is it small finger cuts or the outlier high impact incidents? Who would like to take this? I mean, it's um, talking of safety culture, yeah, Jax? Yeah. Um, I'd like just to come back two seconds from the previous question about the data. Can we harmonize? Can, do, can we have the same data? Um, to a certain extent, I think we can. But imagine we do. We have, I don't know, 100, 1,000, 1 million type of data. Do you think that life can be, can be analyzed only with a, um, a certain number of, of elements? I don't think so. So I think we can go very deep, but if you want to go, especially in, in, in uh, investigation or things like that, you will need to go data and, and that data you don't even know before. And probably you will have future systems, future situation that you don't even know that you don't think about the data now. So I think that we can Yes, we can, we can harmonize the data pretty far, but there will still be a lot of uh, things that you cannot harmonize because you will need the data on a particular case, maybe just once. Once, yeah. Okay, to, to do that question, the simple, the, the simple is both. Finger cuts yeah, yeah. and grounding and sinking and firearm vault. I mean, I, <laughs> it's my daily job. I mean, it's as important there's absolutely no reason not to take into consideration a finger cut because you concentrate on loss of containers, of uh, grounding, etc. It's, uh, it's all it's safety as a whole. And, and probably that if you look into deep, um, probably because I'm not a, a teacher or an academic, but I'm sure that if you improve safety of, fin uh, safety of fingers, you will probably also at the same time improve safety of navigation, safety of uh, handling containers, safety of everything. It's probably all together. Thank you, Jax. I think it's time to run a poll just before we close the session. If I could have that poll over here, please for everybody to answer. And then we will just have a couple of minutes on that and then close. The bit session poll, which was a question to all of you in the audience. Uh, what would refrain you from strengthening data collection and analysis? Now, this is assuming that you said, most of you have said yes in the beginning. So hypothetically, if there was any barrier to collecting data, what would it be? Is that poll there on the pigeonhole? Yes, I can see it. Here we go. Oh, it's too hard to read. So we have a majority saying what you two gentlemen were saying in your presentation, which is the quality of data. And we have lack of dedicated resources, which I think is, is a case, which I, I asked a question on that. But leaving this poll on the screen, I will start from Rafael, your side now, and give you gentlemen to say something in closing. And uh, as the time is, is clicking on, let's keep it down to a minute or so. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's interesting to see that that there is this shared uh, shared idea that we, we have an issue in terms of quality of data, but it's also very interesting also to see that uh, because I'm, I'm just want to add like lack of dedicated resources with missing expertise. We say that also the if you put them together, it's mostly about the expertise that the resource available to deal with data would come eventually number one, and that's also very interesting to see that uh, probably there is a need also to invest. In, uh, in companies, 
in management, but also in shipping companies to, to probably consider data management. And, and probably by, by considering a pool of experts or maybe working with university, partnering with a research institute, with probably private research companies. Maybe by building this research capacity, so this data processing capacity, you will also enrich the quality of data, most probably, because you will have persons who are used to manage data and will be able to identify and help you to identify where are the problems and to find improvement. So that's, that's, that's I think, very, very good sign saying that probably by having this kind of uh, mm. additional capacity, you can also improve the quality of data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rafael. Peter? Well, I, I fully agree with Rafael there. I mean, this industry has changed through COVID in the fact that it's taken on change for the first time. It, 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 had, it had to change, and it's been open to change. The, the, the business model of shipping works, and it got disrupted by, by COVID. It's got in people thinking now. Digital is going to be the future. Um, I, I'm an analog guy, <laughs> I'm not a digital, but the reality is digital is going to be the future. We are going to have to invest as a shipping company, as a ship manager, whatever, in digital techniques. Now is the time to start thinking about that. And instead of doing this scattergun kind of approach to, to data, let's be focused about what it's for. It can drive return on investment in terms of saving money. But it can also drive return on investment from a safety perspective, because a safe ship will also be a very efficient ship. So don't look at this as it's just a pure cost. Mm. There is a return on investing in safety. If you're going to run a business, you run it morally and ethically right for the people there, and you make it safe for them. And if it's in a safe environment, they will have that trust and they will have that ability to um, flourish and, and move forward. And it also creates empowerment. And that's what you really want, where people are being very collaborative and talking about these issues and getting them out there quickly, uh, as we heard before, which I fully agree with, conflict. If there is an issue on the table, let's get, the con get it out there and then let's try and solve it together. Data is going to be that. It's going to be a trigger for that. So this, this is identifying that, as an industry, we are a little bit behind where we perhaps should should be. But now is the time to start looking at that. Thanks, Great. Peter. Jax? When I, when I look at those, those columns, I'm, I'm very, for, for me, I'm going to be very straightforward. The only way that I cannot use data is when there's, there's no data. <laughs> so an availability of data for me is the key challenge. When you don't have data, you don't have data. OK, if you have the quality of data is poor, if you have lack of dedicated resources, okay, invest, put money, uh, uh, improve your quality of data, take decision considering the quality of the data. So, of course, you don't go, I mean, uh, I call that war, uh, fog of war, fog of war. I mean, you don't have the accurate data, so of course you will take decisions in accordance to the quality that you have. But you, it, doesn't, it doesn't, if you need, 100% quality, and you, and you wait until you get it, you're going to wait for a long time. So for me, this doesn't prevent me from acting, from doing things. The only thing that I, don't, I cannot do something about it is an availability of data. If there's no data, there's no data. Mm. OK. So for me, all of these things doesn't prevent me from doing things. Thank Sorry. you, Jacques. Jamie. Am I allowed to interact with the audience for this one? <laughs> no, uh, um, I, think, I think I might stray slightly into being controversial here, but um, I think this is an in, indicative of who we are as an, an industry, actually. I think when we look at what we think we know about, you know, data is actually quite a lot that we don't know about what it is, actually. There's a lot of other industries that have solved this problem. We seem to have not really caught on for the most part. Um, you asked a question earlier with, with regards to um, having the, vo the volume and being able to identify what you shouldn't do, how to clean it and things like that. I mean, you can go into IHS now, you can download all 55,000 vessels, you can go and look at all of the owners and you can clean it all 
in maybe 10 minutes and analyze it in five minutes using the software that's free to download of Google as of today, okay? You don't need to invest anything. Um, if, you, if we as an industry want to really tackle safety, and we were talking about this earlier, it's an attitude change. It, it's an attitude change from the very top all the way down to like at the bottom. If we as an industry all agree that we're doing safety not for uptime reasons, but altruistic reasons, then this can be solved overnight. No problem. It's not about the quality of data or like the lack of dedicated resources or anything like that. We don't need regulators to be behind us because we are very good as an industry of just complying. And this entire panel is about proactive use of data. You don't need a standard to be able to tell you where the floor is. The ceiling is up to you. You can raise yourself to however high you want to be. And, and I think the main thing that I would probably like every single person here to actually think about when you leave this room is that you are like the leaders who can drive this forward. Um, it's difficult for us as an industry to actually try and solve these problems internally, but for the most part, we can outsource it. You, there, there's a talent pool, at least in Singapore and various other maritime centers in the world, you can tap into these knowledge bases to help us solve these problems that you've directly interacted there for a cost-effective and extremely timely in a manner. So I think we as an industry need to pull ourselves up for the sake of wanting to do so, not because somebody told us to. Thanks, Jamie. Ritesh, quickly. Yeah, thanks, Vibas. I think um, in terms of what work we are doing, I would personally very much resonate with quality of data. Uh, but where I disagree, would disagree, is that more often than not, quality of data is associated with what has been reported or not been reported. But I so much agree with what Peter said in his presentation that I think it's about time with the kind of technology and tools we have available at hand with AI and algorithms that we need to move beyond reporting. And reporting is essential, it's very important, but also looking at capturing data. That how well are we able to capture and predict outcomes? And put all of that into perspective and help our seafarers, help our people who are on the front line, who are actually facing those challenges in preventing them into going into serious situations before they become a criticality. And I think that can only happen if we all think about this from the scenario that people are not, in fact, people are the creators of safety and not the sources of error. Thank you, Ritesh. I think we're running out of time. Let me close this. The good news is that cost is at number three, not on the top of the list. The bad news is that it is not at the bottom of the list. It is at number three. <laughs> so if you're considering costs as a factor for um, not using data for proactive safety, I think we should go back to the senior minister of state and tell him to change his speech because that's not going to happen. Now, at the end of the day, uh, data is an enabler, guys. It is just going to enable a proactive safety culture. A safety culture is not going to be created by data. You have to use it to your advantage. Are we proactive? And this is where I think we are running before we can walk. In a, in a room full of seafarers last, last week, when I asked this question, 75, 80% of them said we are proactive. But when I showed them the incidents and all the recurrences, it got changed. Reactive, calculative. The most important thing about being proactive is not to have recurring causes in your incidents. Now, go back and look at your history of incidents in the last two years. And how many times have things been repeated? And then answer this question, are you proactive or still reactive? Now, when that question comes into mind, then you start looking at what are the ways where we can actually change this? And that's where this question came up in our council. And we said, all right, let's start looking at safety not just for the technical issues in the marine environment, uh, looking at data for not just technical issues, but also safety. And that's why we're sitting here discussing this issue. 
So I think if I leave you with this thought that um, what we have said about uh, data, it's there. The quality of data needs to be improved. And we need help in working with it. And that help is available out there. There are companies, there are software as a service providers. There are people who are assisting us. Rafael has given us an offer, right, from WMU. Yes, I will take you up on that, Rafael. But with that, I have to now say we are out of time. My magic clock has gone beyond <laughs> the time allotted to us. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you to all my panelists. It was a great session.